Palm Sunday. Welcome to worship. A new day. What might it hold? Think your way into that thought. I suppose we've all had the experience of waking up, getting up, and knowing that today is going to be different. Daunting, challenging, but that it's the end of one thing and the beginning of something new. Everything will be different. And it starts here. Wow. Eek. First job. New job. The day we move to a new house, a new place, a new community, a new country. Emigration. The morning of a hospital admission, an operation. The morning of a wedding day. The morning you finally cast off on that long voyage in your own boat that you've planned for a lifetime. The first morning of retirement. Few of us will have known all of these things, but we all know some of them. And we all know what it's like at the dawning of a day as big, as potentially life-changing as that. At the end of this day, we won't be where we are now, and there's no going back. But here, for a moment, we stand or sit in the old that's about to give way to the new. That's where the disciples are as our reading opens. As they got started that morning, they didn't know the plot, the agenda for this day. They didn't know it was going to be Palm Sunday. They did know what Jesus had said about coming to Jerusalem weeks ago. Arrest, crucifixion, Good Friday. They must have been scared out of their minds. But as the day gets underway, they must surely have been thinking, no, Jesus has it wrong. It's not going to be anything like as bad as we thought. This is going to be good. Let us pray. We greet you as you come to us anew. God, who has accompanied us all our way. To Abraham in promise and faith. To Moses and Israel in liberation and hope. To us in Christ in transforming love. And how could we come to you today if you did not come to us? How could this be our meeting with you if you did not draw near to us? How in our isolation and distancing could we 
possibly, possibly know that. Separated as we are from each other, we are yet one in you. Your coming changes everything. Jesus, that first Palm Sunday, came to Jerusalem and stood the world on its head. The powerful and the violent were undermined. Authority, kingship and rule subverted by a man who chose to ride a donkey. The people saw it and understood and shouted their Hosanna. But how many of them, Lord, having seen, or at least having glimpsed, chose their ignorance and blindness again? How many, having imagined a different world, slipped back into thinking it will never change? He's just a dreamer, and we won't dream his dream. How many, having shouted Hosanna that first Palm Sunday, were there in Friday's early hours to shout, Crucify him. Forgive us, Lord, when we are like them, when we hail your coming and believe that you can make all things new then lose our trust and slip back and remake all our old compromises. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us the ease with which we switch from faith to lack of trust from expecting the new to doubting anything can change. From awaiting your coming, bearing the future, to consigning you to the comfortable past. As we believe and share and proclaim your forgiveness, help us to believe and know that the gentle king riding a donkey comes bearing the promise of the kingdom and that he can change us and that he can change the world. Amen. Our Gospel reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, reading at the beginning of chapter 21. When they had come near Jerusalem, and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. There are probably three moments, three bits that we all remember from the story of Palm Sunday. The first is the donkey. Who can forget the donkey? Is there an animal that flips the sentimentality switch for us more quickly than a donkey? But we need to remember that thinking of donkeys in that way is only a recent development and it's only in a relatively restricted part of the world, even today, that donkeys are seen as cute and endearing. Few animals 
can have such hard and exploited and unconsidered lives as donkeys, by and large. When fishes flew and forests walked and figs grew upon thorn, some moment when the moon was blood, then surely I was born. With monstrous head and sickening cry, and ears like errant wings, the devil's walking parody on all four-footed things. The tattered outlaw of the earth, of ancient crooked will, starve, scourge, deride me, I am dumb, I keep my secret still. Fools, for I also had my hour, one far fierce hour and sweet. There was a shout above my ears and palms before my feet. And it's that that we need to remember, not the donkey's cuteness or whimsy that fills the prophecy of Zechariah and the story of Palm Sunday with meaning. When we speak of the donkey as a humble beast, we really don't know the half. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, did. That and Zechariah explain his choice. So, they collect and saddle up the donkey, these disciples, and at least the day, this jittery, threatening day, was underway. Don't we often feel better if a day we've had our worries about is now at least underway? Well, that's moment one. There's excitement and expectation all around them, and it can't fail to lift the disciples. Palm leaves strewn under the donkey's feet. Hosannas from the parade and the people joining it. These people, these ordinary, humble people, humble, do you see a theme developing here? These humble people who have been given hope and a sense of possibility, something that was never there before by Jesus. If you're immersed in that, if your compassion, your affection for these people, your sheer sense of shared humanity are engaged, it will seep into your soul. Add to that how we feel if we've been working away at something for months, years, a project, a cause, now our initial enthusiasm and everybody else's interest is drained away. And suddenly it's clear that what you spent a chunk of your life on really is esteemed and valued and admired by people. These disciples had spent a huge chunk of their lives on this project, on Jesus' project of living the life of the kingdom and holding out the love of God to people who had no idea that they could be loved or even noticed by God. And it had all gone so well in Galilee and then, well, this crowd didn't know that, but the disciples knew what Jesus had said was waiting in Jerusalem and none of it was good and all of it was terrifying. And the opposition had grown and the conflict and the plotting And people had fallen away. And there were still good days, but always at the backs of their minds, the disciples must have had Jerusalem. And they must have started this day freaked out of their minds, as we've said. But who could possibly imagine that someone surrounded by happy nobodies who counted for nothing, somebody riding a donkey while being hailed as king. How naive is that? As if Jesus' enemies didn't know the prophecies inside out. Somebody like that could pull down the attention, let alone the murderous hostility of the establishment. The disciples wouldn't have been human if they hadn't been thinking. Maybe this won't be as bad as we feared. Maybe, just maybe, he was wrong about Jerusalem.
disciples' fears. And if picking up and saddling the donkey steadied them a bit and calmed them down, and if people flocking to Jesus' humble, magnificent royal progress cheered and relieved them, well, Jerusalem must have transformed their mood. They were at the center of attention and celebration too, because they were with Jesus. From where they were, embedded in the procession, carried along by the flow, the spate of rejoicing humanity, they wouldn't have had much chance to notice that the mood of the city was a lot more complicated than the mood of the throng. The second part of our reading again from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, at verse 7. They brought the donkey and the colt, and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The whole city was in turmoil. Well, that doesn't sound like undiluted good news. And people asking, Who is this? Think for a moment about how many different ways you can ask that question. How many emphases, different tones of voice you can give it. But the disciples will hardly have picked it up. They're overawed, and they're all relief and exultation. The disciples don't notice, but Jesus does. Jesus, the man of flesh and blood who knew that coming to Jerusalem was more than dangerous, it was certain death. Jesus, totally there for others, totally attuned to them, who knew that even among the people shouting, Hosanna, today, there would be many who changed their tune by the end of the week. People are like that. He could join the dots. Among the people who were asking, who is this, would have been those who were actually asking, who does he think he is? The self-righteous, the authoritarian, the upholders of the status quo, the establishment who wanted him dead. Means, motive, and now, opportunity. And he's there for all of them. That's what love is like. Jesus riding into this totally representative mass of humanity. Every attitude, every type, all there. Jesus coming open and vulnerable. Is Jesus embracing those who welcomed him along with those who already hated him. Those who would desert him and those who would actually kill him. The Dominican theologian, Father Herbert McCabe, reflected on the nature of the love of God and how you'd recognise it's coming into the world. This, he said, is a crucifying world. And loving involves being open to being hurt in a world like this. If you love enough, you'll get hurt. If you love enough, you'll get crucified. That's not a reason not to love, of course. Not to open yourself up to others. Love is, in the end, the only worthwhile thing because God is love. But loving costs. But in a world like this, you'll get hurt if you love enough. And this is how we say it, isn't it? If you love enough, they'll crucify you. So when the love of God, the God who is love, comes into the world, well, what do you think will happen? Jesus is there for the whole of Jerusalem. Those who love him and those who hate him, those who hope and those who fear, those who see something in him that might just be the meaning of their lives and those who see something in him that's such a challenge that they just want to destroy it. For all that, and for all them, Jesus comes. Because Jesus is capable, capable of loving all of that, even the bits that will crucify him. This is the love of God coming into the world. This is Jesus coming to Jerusalem. Join the dots. If God, God's love is as broad, as totally accepting as this, why would you think there's anything in you that God can't love? Here's a poem by the American minister and teacher, Carol Penner, which sums up wonderfully 
The way Jesus comes to embrace everything that's in us in the unbelievably complicated world we live in. Palm Sunday poem, coming to the city nearest you. Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the city nearest you. Jesus comes to the gate, to the synagogue, to houses prepared for wedding parties, to the pools where people waited to be healed, to the temple where lambs are sold, to gardens beautiful in the moonlight. He comes to the governor's palace. Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the city nearest you, to new subdivisions and trailer parks, to paint houses and basement apartments, to the factory, the hospital and the cineplex, to the big box outlet centre and to churches, with the same old, same old message, unchanged from the beginning of time. Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the city nearest you, with his good news and hope erupts, joy springs forth, the very stones cry out, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The crowds jostle and push, they can't get close enough. People running alongside, flinging down their coats before him. Jesus, the parade marshal, waving, smiling, the paparazzi elbow for room, looking for that perfect picture for the headline, the man who would be king. Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the city nearest you, and gets the red carpet treatment. Children waving palm branches from the florist, silk palm branches from Walmart, palms made from green construction paper, hosannas ringing in churches, chapels, cathedrals, in monasteries, basilicas and tent meetings. King Jesus, honoured in a thousand hymns in Canada, Cameroon, Calcutta and Canberra. We love this great, big, powerful, capital K, King Jesus, coming in glory and splendour and majesty and awe and power and might. Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the city nearest you. Kingly, he takes a towel and washes feet. With majesty, he serves bread and wine. With honour, he prays all night. With power, he puts on chains. Jesus, King of all creation, appears in state. In the eyes of the prisoner, the AIDS orphan, the crack addict, asking for one cup of cold water. One coat shared with someone who has none. One heart, yours, and a second mile. Jesus comes to Jerusalem, the city nearest you. Can you see him? Dangerous, really dangerous. It's survivable. It's serious. We will get through it. We are getting through it. It's starting to feel less weird. No, it's still just as weird. Are we where the disciples were that first Palm Sunday, Lord? Saw this coming, dreaded it, wondered how we'd get through it, how we'd cope. And now, here we are. It's all around us. COVID-19. Yet we have hope. Our faith fills us with hope. Not a pale hoping for the best. Far more than that. Hope as your promise to bring us through. There is a beyond to this we know. A far side to this experience. An end to this journey so that another may begin. But we know too Lord that we all, every one of us, the whole of our society, must get there through this strange, unsettling reality, together. 
Nobody's going to tell me. We behave so badly when we're frightened. We're not always a very lovable species. Not always very loving. But you can love us, and that changes everything. And we do see love. Self-sacrificing love, especially now. Love for the stranger and the outcast. Love in the skill and courage of doctors, nurses, healthcare professions. Love in the devotion of carers, the concern of helpers and neighbours. Love in the courage that masters fear. Among those who maintain the life of society, love that reflects your love. Jesus came to Jerusalem and loved all that he saw. The joy, the enthusiasm and the hope. The darkness, the defensiveness, the hate, the generosity, the selfishness, the self-righteousness and humility. In him the love of God embraced it all, accepted it all, all that hate could throw at love and overcame it all. Kindling us this love, Lord Jesus, as you loved us, give birth to love within us and among us. As you accepted us, help us to accept each other, as you saw and knew our need. Help us to grasp and meet the needs of others. As you rode into Jerusalem in courageous love, help us, your disciples of today, to live out that same love that those around us may know its transforming power, our community be strengthened, our society healed, and that this and all our other challenges overcome. The times are strange, but they are in your hands. It's weird. It's real. It's scary. It's dangerous, really dangerous. It's survivable. It's serious. We will get through it. We are getting through it. For you bring us through all things in Christ to behold your glory. And as Jesus taught us, so we pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. rides into Jerusalem to embrace all that is there, even the hatred, for love can overcome all things. In that love, return to your lives in this time of strangeness. For Christ is with us in all of it, the presence of God, the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be with you now and evermore. Amen. Amen.